Maggie, uh, we're ready for you. Thank you. Thank you, Pranima. So um, can you see my screen okay? Let me put it on presentation mode. Did everybody see that, Pranima? Yes, yes. Okay, Perfect. great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pranima, and good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Maggie Brines from Montgomery County Community College and the Northeast Biomanufacturing Centre and Collaborative. Um, the idea for this uh, presentation really came from our evaluation surveys from workshop number one, where several of the participants asked if we could have a presentation how others teach biomanufacturing. <laughs> So I'm going to talk today about how we teach biomanufacturing at Montgomery County Community College and the curriculum that myself and others develop for MBC2 with uh, ATE funding. So Northeast Biomanufacturing Centre Collaborative, uh, many of you are familiar with this already and our website, um, NSF ATE Regional Centre in existence since 2005, all the way up to two, uh, 2021. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why teach MAB productions, the importance of MABs as biopharmaceuticals. And then I'll talk about how we teach MAB production uh, and the course that we developed at Montco. Um, and then a sort of a low tech, if you like, um, version of that MAB production. And the, the reason for that curriculum was really because what we found over the years is that the main obstacle for faculty incorporating our curriculum or biomanufacturing was really the lack of this expensive instrumentation and technology that's needed to teach it. Um, at, at my college, we've had funding uh, at the state and federal level through Perkins, Department of Labor, um, and NSF ATE to allow us to purchase this equipment, but I know not all programs have that level of technology. So we, we've been developing a sort of a low-tech version of our production system, and I'll talk about that as well. This MAP uh, curriculum was developed at MC3 by myself and Hetel Doshi, who's our lab manager, curriculum specialist, and Robin Zook, who's the MBC2 student research coordinator and curriculum specialist. And both of them are on the webinar today as well. So just a little bit about antibodies as biopharmaceuticals. Um, of course, all biologics are protein, well, not all, protein-based biologics are, are protein products uh, secreted from living cells, complex in structure, MAPs are macromolecules at 150 kilodaltons in size, so these are large proteins. They also have quaternary structure, meaning that more than one polypeptide gets together um, to and combines to form the active protein. They require post-translational modifications like glycosylation for function, hence, as Jim explained very nicely, they're always made in mammalian cells and mostly in CHO cells. Proteins are heat, pH, and shear sensitive, which makes um, the downstream process and even upstream process challenging in biomanufacturing. Antibodies are typically blood proteins, of course, produced by B cells to counteract an antigen or a pathogen that our body encounters. Um, monoclonal antibodies are antibodies that come from a single B cell, come a B cell clone, if you like. Monoclonal antibodies bind monospecifically to one antigen, one epitope of one antigen or one cell type. Hence, they're a very high specificity, which makes them incredibly useful for therape therapeutic use. I, I mentioned that they're complex molecule, and here's the structure of an immunoglobulin here. Um, and uh, as you can see, heavy chain and light chain, and most of you are very familiar with this already, but just to point this out, because some of this comes up a little bit later, um, this region here is known as the FC domain, the fragment crystallization, and this region here is known as the F, the FAB domain, or the fragment antigen binding. Um, two heavy chains, two light chains, and this region here is the antigen binding site or the variable region or the complementarity uh, determining region. All three of those terms are used for this region here that actually binds to the epitope on the antigen. So 
A solution of a monoclonal antibody is a solution that contains only this. All the antibodies are the same. They all bind to a single epitope on the target antigen. A solution of polyclonal antibodies looks more like this, where you have antibodies that are binding to different epitopes on the surface of your antigen. Um, imagine our body's response to encountering the spike protein from coronavirus after immunization. Um, B cells will produce antibodies against different epitopes on the spike protein uh, surface, and you'll get a pool of antibodies against that particular spike protein antigen. So we can, when we produce a monoclonal antibody, all the antibodies look just like this. So why teach biomanufacturing of MABs? MABs are large, complex proteins, um, not the easiest, uh, production system perhaps to use in your teaching. However, they're so significant in the, the biopharmaceutical landscape that um, this information is really useful for, for the students to move forward and move into the industry. So monoclonal antibodies account for 50% of the overall biotherapeutic market. And in 2020, the global sales of MABS was about $140 billion. And this is only going to increase it's predicted to increase to over 368 billion in 2027. So MABs are not going anywhere. We're just going to see more monoclonal antibodies being approved by the regulatory agencies and be on the market. Um, and in fact, the FDA in April approved its 100th monoclonal antibody product with GSK's Dostilumab. And it's already approved its 101st monoclonal antibody about a month later. Um, since 2015, the FDA has approved an average of 10 MABs per year. And here is kind of the growth of the, the MABs in the biopharmaceutical landscape. Uh, the first monoclonal antibody was approved way back in 1986, and that was an anti-CD3, purely murine mouse uh, monoclonal antibody that was um, directed against uh, CD3 on T cells, and it was used for uh, uh, patients post-transplantation. It didn't have much success on the market actually post-approval because of the, the hammer effect of the patients um, that, that induced in the patients, the human um, anti-mouse antibody effect, because this was a purely mouse antibody and the human body re reacted against that and kind of neutralized it. Um, Moving forward, the next one wasn't approved till 1994. And then once we got to about 2015, as you can see here, there was an average of about 10 a year being produced. And this is only predicted to go, uh, continue on this sort of a exponential track that you see here. The different color bars represent uh, different types or classes of antibodies, monoclonal antibody products. Um, uh, the canonical antibody with the heavy light chain uh, traditional structure that I showed you. Then there's also several antibody drug conjugates on the market and many of them you know, in clinical trials. Bispecific antibodies are <clears throat> really a growing trend and about 20% of antibodies that are in clinical trials at the moment are bispecific antibodies. There's also fragment antibodies and a few other variations. Um, and these are some of those antibody formats I just mentioned. So this is the, the traditional MAB product and then an antibody drug conjugate uh, here where you have your uh, monoclonal antibody and attached would be a toxin. The antibody would take the toxin to a specific cancer cell, for example, where the toxin would then, the small molecule drug would then um, kill the cell. And this is an example of a bispecific antibody where you can see one arm would recognize one epitope and the other arm would recognize another. Um, and there's a anti-cancer bispecific antibody on the market where one arm recognizes if we CD20 on B cells, this is an anti-leukemia monoclonal antibody, and the other one recognizes uh, CD3 on T cells, so bringing the T cells to the cancerous B cells in order for them to be um, destroyed. And here you see um, fragments, uh, a bispecific fragment antibody where you have um, 
two CDRs for one epitope and um, two CDRs for another epitope. And then you have fragment antibodies where you just have the fat, the fat domain and then the, the variable domains. And then um, newest in the market, or maybe not even in the market yet, I'm not sure, are nanobodies where it's just one single variable domain. So these are all in development. So this trend in, in uh, approval and development of antibodies is only going to continue, as I mentioned. This is the landscape of, of clinical trials at the moment, the number of monoclonal antibodies in clinical trials. So in 2020, there was about 160 monoclonal antibody trials ongoing. So you can imagine the approval um, rate is only going to continue. And most of those were anti-cancer uh, monoclonal antibodies. Um, many are um, PD1, PDL1 anti, PD1 anti PDL1 antibodies for, for cancer treatment. Here are a few other examples of antibodies on the market. And here you see um, Regeneron's antibody cocktail of two monoclonal antibodies directed against the SARS CoV 2 spike protein. And that got emergency use authorization on in 2020 to fight COVID 19. And then this is uh, a blockbuster antibody from AbV that was first um, approved in 2002, and that's an anti-TNF-alpha monoclonal antibody originally approved for rheumatoid arthritis. And um, GSK's um, Nucala is an anti-IL-5 monoclonal antibody, and that's quite significant for us because we actually go and watch that production process in our, the nearby facility in Montgomery County. Oh, excuse me. Um, and as you'll see in a moment, we're actually producing an anti-IL-8 monoclonal antibody in the lab. So, so the relevance there is, is great. It works really well for, for them understanding this process. Um, and then you have Regeneron's uh, Dupazin, which is an anti-IL-4 monoclonal antibody um, developed for to fight atopic, atopic dermatitis. And um, this PD-1 receptor antibody again by Regeneron for metastatic uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And what you can see in some of these, I put some of the doses in here just to reflect the fact that monoclonal antibody doses are high compared to other uh, biologics that are on the market. This one here is 350 milligrams in three weeks, um, two milligrams every two weeks, uh, excuse me, 200 milligrams every two weeks. So, Monoclonal antibody has to have to be produced at high concentrations. The yields have to be high in order to meet the demand. And this is just an example of the, the mode of action of um, GSK's Nucala binding to circulating IL-5. So it's an anti-IL-5 uh, molecule, interleukin-5, binds to circulating IL-5 in the blood. Um, preventing that it from interacting with the IL-5 receptor in sinophils and basophils and um, dampening down that response in these uh, uh, asthma patients. So just um, briefly, all the curriculum I'm going to talk about today can be found on the NBC2 website at biomanufacturing.org under curriculum resources. There is a Biomanufacture of Monoclonal Antibody curriculum page where you'll find all of the um, SOPs and batch records for MAP production. And in addition, in the instructors portal, you'll find all of our sort of data sheets that we developed last year um, to assist with, with faculty teaching online biomanufacturing courses. The course I'm going to talk about, or, or the set of experiments I'm going to talk about, um, is uh, we use this manufacture of monoclonal antibodies lab manual that we put together last year and also the introduction to biomanufacturing textbook, which is also on the website. So teaching mad production. Today I'm going to focus mostly on the process. I'm going to talk about the process of upstream, downstream, and the testing, the analytics, the quality control, and the importance of doing all of this in a simulated CGMP environment with the appropriate documentation. Um, 
and working in a, a controlled manner, if you like, controlling the process. Also important to teach is quality assurance. June stressed that at the point of FDA regulation, FDA oversight in, bio in biopharmaceuticals, um, I always start with an overview of facilities that really gives the students an understanding of uh, clean rooms, how clean rooms are maintained, how companies lay out a facility to, to help control the process, um, microbiological control, um, environmental monitoring, validations of equipment, systems and assays, process development and metrology. So those are other components that I teach in the biomanufacturing course in addition to the process and the analytics. So this is a commercial process uh, flow diagram for MAB production. And this is what we're trying to mimic in the biomanufacturing course. Um, in this particular process flow diagram, the upstream processing is done in three uh, individual seed trains. So you start, as Jim mentioned, with your frozen vial of Cho cells, recombinant Cho cells, um, from your working cell bank, and you expand that up through a shake flask or spinner flask or tea flask to um, small, usually disposable bioreactors, and then on to larger bioreactors, each time scaling up in a one to five or a one to 10 manner, but, but no more. Um, and um, you finally get to production bioreactors. In this case, these production bioreactors may be around 5,000 litres. If they're traditional stainless steel bioreactors, maybe 2,000 litres of their single-use bioreactors. Um, this is then pooled and it, process, it, it proceeds to the harvest stage. During harvest, the cultures are centrifuged and then go through a microfiltration, a depth filtration step um, to clarify the, the media before it goes into downstream processing. So this part here is the downstream processing and typically the first step in downstream is protein A capture chromatography followed by viral inactivation because of the pH uh, at this point. We'll talk about that in a few minutes diafiltration, and then onto some intermediate and polishing chromatography steps, such as ion exchange and hydrophobic interaction chromatography. So that in general is what you'll see um, for MAP production at a commercial scale. And as I mentioned, this is what we want to mimic in the course. This is core scale, um, a process flow diagram for core scale manufacture of a uh, monoclonal antibody. The cell line we use uh, is available at the ATCC as Cho DP12 cells. So these are recombinant for the heavy and light chain of a monoclonal antibody um, directed against um, interleukin-8. So we purchased this recombinant cell line and we um, thaw the cells and we grow them in a spinner flask. This could also be a shake flask. Um, we grow our cells in spinner flasks uh, with an 100 mil volume. So the, the students grow these cells for about a week, sometimes six days, and um, monitor the cell growth every day. And once they've reached late log phase, we scale up into our bioreactor. So this is a traditional stirred vessel uh, bioreactor. And we're um, at the moment, adding to what we do and um, introducing wave bioreactors as well and single use. And I know ISO is going to cover single use production um, a little bit later. So at the moment, we're using these stirred uh, tank or stirred, stirred vessel bioreactors. So the students scale up then. So they learn um, the process control of the bioreactor. They learn how to assemble the bioreactor, um, do the media hold, and then inoculate the bioreactor with the 100 mil culture from the spinner flask. Once they grow that for about a week in culture, monitoring every day, they um, go through harvest. So again, centrifugation followed by filtration, just like in the commercial scale, but again, um, lab scale. And we don't do depth filtration. We just simply use a 0.2 micron filtration unit here to clarify the medium. Once they've done that, we go through a concentration step using ultrafiltration. And this is our 
tangential flow filtration, autofiltration unit right here, and one of the students operating it. Um, so that concentrates our media from uh, a litre down to about 50 millilitres. And after that, we're ready to go into downstream processing using this ACTA protein A, um, or ACTA system and protein A capture chromatography. Um, following that, uh, intermediate chromatography, ion exchange, cation exchange would be next, and also analyzing the, the purified monoclonal antibody. So just to focus a little bit on our upstream processing unit, so we use this uh, DP12 cells that are producing anti-IL8 MAP. Um, this is the catalog number from the ATCC. Um, and you can also, you know, you can actually get the, the patent, the original patent for, for these cells that actually describes the expression vector that was used to introduce the heavy light chains, the, the genes for the heavy light chains of this particular MAP. So over a three week period, the students will inoculate the spinner flask and here you see two of the students, actually in this case, he's sampling the spinner flask, but uh, the students always work in pairs. Uh, the student here has the batch record. She's going to be signing off as witnessing the student here doing the inoculation or the sampling. Um, we grow them the cells in the spinner flask for five to six days, um, monitoring every day and then scale up to the production bioreactor, which in our case is one liter. This is just a regular batch mode production. We inoculate, we grow the cells, we harvest. Um, we have done fed batch as well uh, to extend and, and actually produce more cells, hence more antibody, but typically our batch record is just a batch mode. And then we harvest the bioreactor. Um, and these are the SOPs and the batch record that we use to, to do the series of experiments and they are also on the, the website. This is our um, scale up to our bioreactor and during the spinner flask process, as well as the bioreactor process, the students are sampling the cells every day and monitoring these uh, critical process parameters. So they, they look at cell growth by measuring viable cells per mil, uh, they check the cell viability, pH, optical density, glucose concentration, lactic concentration, and titer, how much antibody is being produced. And they um, do that testing daily and then add it to the batch record in a table that looks something like this. So they're, they're generating this data as they would in, in industry, um, collecting it in the batch record, and I should say that the students work in teams of usually six and um, they have their own bioreactor. So, so they're, they're working in a group. There's, there's lots of opportunity for, for interaction and teamwork and they generate the data. And then they have to generate these charts, which um, allows them to describe the data and present the data showing an understanding of the process. Um, and here are a couple of the charts that they produce this is our growth curve, which you can see lag exponential going into um, plateau phase right here and our viable cell percent viability across the tops, maintaining high viability, the cells are healthy. And this is a typical growth curve for these ChoDP12 cells. Um, and then optical density in red, in this case, you can see the optical density is increasing as the concentration of the cells increase. So these are typical results that the students generate when doing the, I think this is the spinner flask, but the bioreactor flask, I didn't, excuse me, the bioreactor data I didn't include because in the interest of time, um, here are the glucose and lactate level data um, for the same experiment. And um, you can see here, again, the green is our growth curve, and then you see an increase in lactate as the cells are um, utilizing the glucose. Glucose concentration is going down um, as the cells go into exponential phase and lactate concentration is increasing. So these are critical parameters that are uh, measured in a commercial scale production. Um, and it's important for the students to understand this and, and sort of be able to monitor this as they grow their cells. 
So I'm going to pause there for just a second to see if there's any questions relating to um, the upstream processing and, and anything I've discussed so far. I haven't been able to see the, the chat. Um, happy to answer any questions before I move on to downstream. I have a question. Yes. Um, I was wondering as a community college, how you manage the um, frequent um, sampling with your students, presuming that they don't, you don't actually meet with them every day for lecture lab? Yeah, that's a good question, Emily. So at the beginning of, of the course, when they, um, when we start growing the cells, there's an understanding the cells have to be monitored every day. And it's kind of a real world situation. You know, you're responsible for these cells who have to be monitored. We have had them even come in on the weekends, but typically um, Hetel and I do the weekend testing but they do come in every day. So they come in off times. Um, the work in teams, as I mentioned, of six students. So they take turns coming in. We have two, two students come in each day to do the monitoring because there's several tests that have to be done. It takes about an hour to, to sample and do the, the tests that they have to do. So um, having that, uh, the idea of the, they have their own company, they have a company name, they work in a team, they have a company name, they're kind of proud of, they want it to work, that they have buy-in, they're invested in this. So we don't usually have trouble having volunteers coming in off times to do the sampling because they want it to be a success basically. Thank you. So moving on to the downstream process. So um, this picture here was taken from an onstream, excuse me, an online learning module that we developed for downstream processing the monoclonal antibody. Um, and as you can see here, uh, centrifugation depth filtration. I know this, this is kind of small, but it goes through the whole process, protein A capture chromatography and so on. Um, and has little videos that describe um, stacked disc centrifuges for continuous centrifugation, uh, depth filtration, and then capture chromatography with the protein A capturing the monoclonal antibody. That's what we want to replicate in, in the course again. Um, so once they've harvested the bioreactor and concentrated it using the tangential flow filtration system, um, we purify the monoclonal antibody through protein A chromatography. So the instrument that we use is an active pure system. It's a programmable chromatography system for fast purification of proteins. BioRAD also has a, a different version of this that's quite popular uh, for teaching biomanufacturing. Um, and just a little bit about protein acephalose of, for those of you that are not familiar. So protein acephalose has been used for, for extensively for decades to, to isolate immunoglobulins. Protein A is a protein that originally came from the surface of Staph aureus. It binds, has strong affinity to immunoglobulins. It's also a protein G, it's also another protein that's used. Um, it binds to the heavy chain, the FC domain of a monoclonal antibody. And this is what a beat and uh, protein A and monoclonal antibody interaction might look like. So we have a chromatography fault column where the stationary phase is agarose or cephalose beads with protein A covalently linked to it. That protein A will capture the monoclonal antibody when it's loaded onto the column. The antibodies loaded at or bound at pH 7 and diluted at pH 3. So this is a very standard procedure. It's exactly what's done very large scale in industry. Um, and this is the chromatography cycle that we want the students to learn, of course, the chromatography process where we equilibrate the column, we load our, our sample that we're to you know, purify our protein. We then wash the material that doesn't interact or bind to the column. And then we loot with the appropriate pH or ionic strength buffer, and then we regenerate the column. So protein A is a, the most expensive resin there is. Um, so we can regenerate our column and use it up to 10 or 15 times. And these are the SOPs and the batch records that we developed for the downstream process of a map. Um, these are two of my students in injecting a concentrated uh, sample of 
of condition media into the, the actor unit here. So we're binding at pH seven, we're eluting at pH three, and then we neutralize the MAP fractions as they come off by introducing uh, one molar trace pH nine to bring them back to neutral temperature, excuse me, pH. And of course, in a commercial scale production, typically this is when the, the viral inactivity inactivation step is done. That low pH is enough to uh, inactivate viruses without um, uh, destroying the tertiary or quaternary structure of the antibody. So the really nice thing about the ACTA system and systems like that is they produce a really nice chromatogram. And this is a chromatogram from one of the monoclonal antibody runs. Um, the ACTA system uses the unicorn um, software and that's something that our industry partners are very uh, happy about because they want our students to be trained in the unicorn software. Um, and this is what a chromatogram looks like after protein A chromatography. So typically, as you, as you can see, this is where the, the, the load is injected or conditioned medium is injected. And here we have the flow through peak. Um, this trace represents the absorbance at 280 nanometers. You have the flow through peak, and then as we wash the column, um, the trace comes back down to baseline, and then we introduce buffer B. So this trace here is the concentration of buffer B. It goes from zero to 100% buffer B. And soon after adding buffer B, you see the antibody is eluted. And the antibody is eluted in, in a one mil fraction here, fraction 13. Um, so a very nice, this is, typical of affinity chromatography, you get that lovely um, single peak coming off with the monoclonal antibody. And then the students then analyze that in an STS page gel, and it looks something like this. Um, here you have the pre-column material, and this large band here is from the serum albumin. So for these Cho DP12 cells, we had uh, issues growing them in completely serum-free medium. So we actually use low IgG serum to grow the cells. Um, so this is uh, serum albumin right here, this big band. Um, and then you can see the fraction. This is fraction 13. And we see two prominent bands here, and one being the light chain and one being the heavy chain. So this is SDS page. So denaturing polycrylamide gel electrophoresis. And um, in this type of electrophoresis, we're actually, we prepare the samples by heating them, adding SDS, adding beta mercaptoethanol, and that destroys all quaternary, tertiary, and secondary structure. So the antibody is broken down to its components, being the light chain and the heavy chain. Remember, there's two light chains and two heavy chains in, in the antibody structure. So we can see here, and this is lane here is overloaded. There's 15 micrograms of pure protein, purified protein loaded here. And you can see the trace uh, contaminating proteins from the cells and from the media. So we can see these process contaminants here. Um, but in that single step, we have a protein that's about 95% pure. And that's typical for uh, protein achromatography. Um, this would then be further purified using cation exchange and maybe hydrophobic interaction chromatography. But in that one step, we have a highly purified monoclonal antibody. We then continue with a few more QC experiments um, and we developed an ELISA assay to quantify uh, the level of IL-8 in our cell culture medium as the cells grow, and also you know, in, uh, to analyze our purified material as well. And this also serves in a way as a potency assay because it shows that the antibody that we are producing binds to IL-8 specifically. We also do um, an aggregate analysis using HPLC size exclusion. So those are two QC experiments we do post-purification. For our ELISA experiment, we use an indirect ELISA where we bind IL-8 to our 96-well plate. We use our cell culture medium or a purified monoclonal antibody as the primary antibody. Then we bind a secondary antibody, as many of you are familiar with, I'm sure. 
that has um, horseradish peroxidase enzyme conjugated to it, we add a substrate to the enzyme and it produces a color change. So that's a you know, standard ELISA assay. Um, by having the students do a standard curve with known amounts of monoclonal antibody, they can then determine the level of antibody in their cell culture media to determine titer and also in, uh, in the flow through and also in the fractions post chromatography. And this is what the titer uh, chart looks like. So this is the spinner flask. And here we see our growth curve again, um, lag, log, and heading towards plateau. And in red, we see the an, um, monoclonal antibody concentration determined by ELISA. So you see there's no production in the log phase. And then as the culture goes into uh, exponential phase, you see the titer of antibody increasing. Um, and this is also done for, for the bioreactor samples as well. So it allows the, the students to understand titer, understand yield, understand where antibodies get lost, um, how we could improve and optimize different systems within our, our process. One area we where we tend to lose a lot of antibody, and I think this is quite common, is in the tangential flow filtration step, where we have um, drug substance antibody that gets bound irreversibly to the filter. Um, so we tend to lose some um, monoclonal antibody on that step. But it allows you to introduce that whole idea of, you know, protein is the cash, yield is important. How much did you lose? How much did you start out with after harvest? And what was lost during the, the downstream process, for example? Um, and then this, this describes the HPLC size exclusion chromatography aggregate test. Um, this is an FDA required test for monoclonal antibodies because they tend to aggregate at high concentrations. And of course, um, antibodies are administered at high concentrations. So this is a test that's required by the FDA. Um, and this is a chromatogram from our HPLC showing absorbance at uh, 280 and the y-axis, you can't see that here, and also um, retention time on the x-axis. So this is typical for an HPLC test. And you can see um, the trace here showing a peak for our monoclonal antibody. These peaks here represent the buffer components. As you can see here, this is a chromatogram for buffer only. So you can see um, these components come from the buffer. Uh, we see this single peak here representing our MAP. And we uh, know this is our MAP peak uh, because A, we've run purified monoclonal antibody. And B, because we ran a set of standards, I didn't show them here, but the one of the standards is 150 kilodaltons and it almost mimics exactly where this peak is. So we're sure that this is our monoclonal antibody peak of 148 or so kilodaltons. We don't see any peaks in the area where we would expect aggregation. So if you recall in size exclusion chromatography, large molecules come off first. They have a smaller retention, a shorter retention time. And we see nothing here in the area where we would expect to see aggregates in this uh, shorter retention time. So this particular um, preparation has no aggregate contamination. It does, however, have this little blip here, this little shoulder, which is probably some type of breakdown structure or antibody fragment. So that's another QC test we've done um, for uh, monoclonal antibody um, analytics. I'm going to pause there and see if there's any questions on, on that uh, process and, and how we teach it. So, the next thing I want to talk about is how do, how do you do that small scale, no, no fancy equipment? So you don't have a bioreactor, you don't have an active system, or maybe you even do have that equipment, but you would like to just introduce students to um, biomanufacturing in a more simplistic way, maybe in an introduction to uh, biomanufacturing course. So we out to do a set of experiments for just sort of a low tech, low tech MAB production. And this is the flow diagram for that. So similarly, you take your frozen 
a vial of cells from your working cell bank, you resuscitate them and you inoculate T75 flasks. So we start with T75s and you can stop there if you don't have a spinner flask. We typically then expand to our spinner flask, just like you saw before. Um, spinner flasks are inexpensive, they're about $200. Um, you grow the cells for six or seven days as I described and monitor the cells daily for all those um, critical attributes. And you harvest the cells by benchtop centrifugation and um, 0.2 micron filtration and move on to gravity uh, capture chromatography, no actor, uh, no, no uh, biorad biologics, um, simple one mil gravity columns that many of us use already in our intro to biotechnology or techniques courses, and then analyze by SDS page, and then verify that you've actually purified an anti iolate map by doing a Western blot. <clears throat> so these are all experiments that many of, many of us already use in our biotechnology programs. <clears throat> Production processing, as I mentioned, to T75s or <clears throat> expanding to a spinner flask harvest, you end up with, if you go to a spinner flask, two 50 mil uh, centrifuge tubes uh, with 50 mil each of condition medium. No need to um, concentrate here, uh, filter and go right into the downstream process. So here's our spinner flask. Uh, that had been inoculated with the T7, T75 um, cells. So I should mention that Cho DP12s um, have been developed to grow in suspension, but they will still grow adherently. So we can grow them in T75s as adherent cells. They will produce MAB um, in that, those conditions as well. And then we scale up to suspension. So the students get experience with adherent cells and suspension cells. We scale up to the spinner flask and uh, harvest once they reach the plateau um, stage of the growth curve. So again, cell viability here, 100% uh, about, and then um, uh, cell density gets to about a million cells per mil, typically. Um, moving on to downstream then, using, as I mentioned, gravity chromatography, collecting the fractions, not in a fraction collector, but just in uh, microfuse tubes, and then analyzing on SDS page followed by Western. <clears throat> so these are the one mil um, protein A uh, columns that we're using, and they can be purchased from uh, Thermoscientific. It also comes with the buffers as well. It comes as a pack of five columns, but each column can be used 10 times. So once you have that initial uh, expense, you can use them in multiple um, courses. So again, what we want to get across to the students is this chromatography process. And we're doing exactly that in their gravity chromatography. We're equilibrating the column. We load just 10 mils of the conditioned medium, the medium uh, that was produced either in the flasks or the, uh, the tea flask or the spinner flask. Um, <clears throat> the protein A binds to the resin, excuse me, the antibody binds to the protein A resin, and then we elute it at low pH and then regenerate the column. So this system obviously doesn't produce that lovely chromatogram that you saw in the um, ACTA system, However, <clears throat> the students can take those fractions, um, put them in a spectrophotometer, read the absorbance at 280 and generate their own chromatogram. And I think this is a really great introduction to um, chromatograms for students is to create their own. They have then an understanding of what's happening once they get to the more sophisticated ACTA system. So you, here you see <clears throat> in blue, the absorbance at 280 of the flow through um, going back to baseline after washing. And then once the elution buffer is introduced here, concentration of buffer B here, just like you saw in the active chromatogram, you can see the protein eluted. So the, the students can create their own chromatograms um, that reflect exactly what's happening in the experiment. Um, analyzing the fractions and also the pre-column and, and flow-through material on an SCS page. 
Um, and uh, here we have the pre-column material, the condition medium, and the flow-through material. And this is a wash step. Here you can see that you know, strong band that represents the serum albumin. And then you have the purified map. And in that you know, gravity one mil column, really produces extremely pure monochronal antibody. So in this lane here, there's 6.5 micrograms of the MAB, and we cannot see at this level any, and with chromatic staining, any contaminating bands. So again, a high level of purity um, comparable to what we achieve on the ACTA with this gravity system. Uh, the students can then calculate the protein concentrations based on the absorbance at 280 or you do uh, perform a Bradford's assay, for example, um, using the conversion of one absorbance unit at 280 for an IgG protein uh, is 1.35 mg per mil. So we can then make that um, estimation of the protein content and the purified MAB fractions. Um, we then use those fractions to use the fraction and also the condition medium to do a Western blot. And again, this is the verification that the students have um, purified an anti IL8 map. So we use an eye blot system, a semi dry blot system for a Western blot, but you could also use something like the um, Invitrogen uh, transfer system as well to produce the blot. And um, as you recall, uh, Western blots are when you immobilize your protein on a solid membrane, PVDF or nitrocellulose, and then probe that with a primary antibody um, against your protein of interest. So our antigen in this case is IL-8, our primary antibody is our condition medium um, after the filtration step or the purified monoclonal antibody that we produced with protein A chromatography. So we add our primary antibody, either one of these, our secondary antibody, uh, which is um, conjugated with alkaline phosphatase in this case, and then adding a substrate to get the color change. So this is the outcome of our Western blot. Um, and this is our IL-8 lighting up both with the condition medium. So this was just using 10 mils of straight condition medium. So even if you didn't go through the downstream process, you, you could actually show that your upstream process is producing anti il MAB by taking the condition medium and using that in a Western blot. This is a one in a hundred dilution of the purified anti il monoclonal antibody. And here we see a doublet that we believe is um, our protein plus and minus the his tag. So not complete removal of the his tag here. We knew from our vendor that it was a his tagged um, IL-8 protein that we had purchased. And when we, we inquired about the, the double bands, that, that's the outcome we got. Um, so here we show that the students have pure, we have produced and purified um, anti il monoclonal antibody. And you can see that here with the Western blot. So in this, sorry? Was that, did I have a question there or just background? Um, so again, uh, without developing ELISA, you can still have that verification assay that you have indeed produced and purified your monoclonal antibody. Um, so that's, this is kind of the timeline of that introduction to monoclonal antibody um, biomanufacturing, how you could work this into an intro to biotech course. Uh, again, uh, with, with those methods, introducing those methods and those techniques using monoclonal antibodies rather than maybe something you're already doing right now, like GFP. Um, so over a three or four week period, we can fit in all of those um, experiments. And those are the SOPs that are, we developed for that sort of a low-tech intro um, MAP production. And I just want to finish off by um, answering Linnea's questions from earlier. Uh, in fact, is anybody um, offering a face-to-face -face biomanufacturing workshop this summer? And um, 
we will be um, offering our final mini bioman um, NBC2 mini bioman workshop in July, so July 20 to 22nd, um, face to face, a hands on workshop at Montgomery County Community College in PA. And we'll be um, teaching this map production that I talked about today. So if you're interested in attending, uh, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. And um, I will stop there for an email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maggie. Uh, this was fantastic. Definitely took me back uh -huh. to my manufacturing days. 